Well, we have finally made it to Africa, the culmination and end of our lecture. So this part will not be particularly long, but there are a lot of things to talk about. Although, as you can imagine, a lot of my uh, discussion, say, on technology was really built around Africa. So you can go back and you can review your notes or review those videos on technology, and you can apply that to uh, what was going on in Africa throughout the 1880s and into uh, the early 20th century before World War I. Now, Africa is, uh, Africa is um, not unique, but I don't think colonialism and imperialism in Africa is very f well fully understood by students. They know it happened. They know that there were there was brutality. Uh, but I don't think, I think if you were to go up to an average undergraduate student who has some knowledge of history, uh, they probably wouldn't know quite as much about Africa as they would say know about India or the Caribbean. And I think it's because Africa is so dynamic and there's so much going on that it's very difficult to simply have uh, a good firm grip on it because a lot like Southeast Asia, there are so many European powers involved and so much dynamic that to really get a firm grip, it's not just one group. It's not the Russians and the British. It's not the French and the British. Uh, it's, it's, the Germans, the Italians, the French, the British, the uh, the Dutch, the Belgians. Uh, there are t uh, just all the all the European powers are involved, uh, and, and even the United States has a small thing or two to say about Africa. So there is a lot going on here, and so we're going to try and boil this down into its simplest parts. Before we really discuss the 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 what would refer what is referred to as the scram excuse me the scramble for Africa, I mentioned earlier, a number of videos ago, how large Africa was and how traditional maps do not uh, present Africa in its true light by size, and this is a great diagram or series of pictures that show that Africa is huge, uh, other than uh, Eurasia, which is uh, um, hang on, put my pointer on, which is Asia and then, or which is, I'm sorry, Europe connected to Asia because that's technically one continent. A, uh, Europe is just an appendage off of Asia. That's why it's called Eurasia. Other than Eurasia, Africa is the largest continent. It is bigger than uh, North America. It is bigger than South America. It is bigger than Antarctica. When you look at old maps like this, I guess that was the map. When you look at old maps like this, Africa doesn't look small, but it certainly doesn't look as big as it actually is. Uh, North America, for example, looks like it may be larger. South America, about the same size. Uh, clearly, Asia, Europe, Eurasia as one whole is is bigger, uh, but it it, it appears that Africa is just not simply as large, and that was done for a number of reasons I won't get into because there's varying arguments as to why. Some say it was because they were trying to make um, Europe more centralized in the map. Uh, others argue that it was done uh, to emphasize the prime meridian, which runs straight through the, um, straight through the uh, uh, map here, through Greenwich. England right through there. Others say it was a form of uh, intellectual racism by diminishing the size and influence of Africa in, in favor of uh, Western European countries. Uh, for, for our purposes, it's neither here nor there. But comparatively so, when you look at an actual size uh, variation, you'll see that Africa is gigantic. Europe is not nearly as big population-wise nor land size as is the United States. And the United States is not small. The United States is big. But as you can see here, it doesn't even take up the top portion of Africa. And that the same goes with, uh, with uh, the countries of South America, India, uh, so on and so forth. So Africa is gigantic. It is also extremely diverse. It is one of the most diverse continents on the planet at this time. Uh, 
we think of Africa as being filled with Africans. Uh, that is a very outsider's view of Africa, the way that Americans view Native Americans. They are American Indians. Well, that's true to, to a certain extent, but they themselves would not view themselves as that way, nor would the Africans. A lot of that a lot of those views, what would be called pan-American Indianism or pan-Africanism, come, come as a form of um, protest against colonialism, a way of trying to build a common brotherhood between uh, peoples who were subjugated by European powers, European or American powers. In reality, Africans, a lot like um, American Indians identified themselves with their kingdoms and their tribes. So in the United States, you have the Sioux and you have uh, the Lakota, the Blackfoot, the Apache, the Comanche, the Cherokee, the Creek. In Africa, you have the Ashanti, you have the uh, Congolese, you have um, uh, people from Mali, Ghana, uh, Egypt. All of these places are different. They are unique. They have their own unique cultures, their unique histories, their unique um, uh, languages and abilities, and uh, they are just very different. They are as different as Europe is different. So in Europe, we have the British and the French and the Germans and the Spanish and the Italians. Uh, we don't look at all of Europe as simply Europe. Uh, Africa is no different. It's extremely diverse religiously. It's extremely diverse culturally. The only thing that they really have in common that Europeans kind of bind them all together is, is that most people in Africa below the Sahara are black. Uh, above the Sahara, they are more olive complected, looking a lot like Arabs. And in some cases, they look a lot like Greeks or Spaniards. But below the Sahara in sub-Saharan Africa, they are black. And that seemingly is the only thing that they, seem, they, they have in common. Uh, and Europeans kind of group them all as, quote, Africans. And that is why we call them Africans. Africa in the uh, uh, 1880s and all the way up till World War I in 1914 is largely independent. Before, eight, be before that period of 1880 to 1914, Africa is largely independent. Uh, it is the last place on the globe where serious colonization takes place, as a lot of the other places like South America and the Caribbean and that have all been uh, kind of subjugated or placed under colonial or imperialistic rule by colonial powers. Africa for a long time stayed relatively independent uh, with its powerful kingdoms and uh, tribal federations controlling the continent. Many of the reasons why that was was mainly a lot of the ones I addressed with uh, regards to technology, uh, Europeans being unable to actually get into Africa without suffering severe uh, issues such as, well, death doesn't get any more severe than that. Uh, you all, there was also this need uh, for Europeans to uh, have partners that would help uh, conduct trade because Africa is such a gigantic continent. And so uh, the Portuguese, for example, and the Spanish uh, and the British, they usually had smaller uh, trading posts here, uh, either on the continent directly, but in coastal communities or on islands. It's hard to see, but there's little islands here uh, where uh, trading posts were established. And this was mainly for uh, commodities such as timber, coffee, and perhaps the most famous commodity of all, slavery. Uh, you also had other commodities like ivory. But later on with these new technological advancements and the, the spirit of imperialism, as slavery begins to fall away, the British, the French, they're all going after slavery, but they're also going after commodities and markets and, and looking for conquest. Uh, they begin to desire more hands-on control of Africa. And so there is a meeting that's held in 1881 in Berlin called the Berlin Conference, where the great powers of the world debate and argue of how they are going to take Africa and, and divide it up among themselves. If you recall, at the very, very beginning of this entire lecture, I had this picture here. Let's get back there. I don't think I'll make a, a, a thing quite as long as this. I just, there's so much to cover and I really didn't want to shortchange you. I do apologize for that, but I think a lot of you would appreciate that there's a lot of detail here that needs to be discussed. Um, this, 
this is a political cartoon that discusses this uh, or uh, displays this conference. This is called the Berlin Conference. Uh, this is the German Kaiser in charge of Germany sitting around with uh, members of uh, Great Britain, France, Italy, the other great European powers, and they are carving up Africa, which is incidentally written in French, Afrique. And they are deciding and debating who's going to get what piece of Africa. And the reason why they do this is because there is this desire to raid the area for uh, raw materials and goods and new markets, all the classic imperialistic tropes. There is this desire to cut down and eliminate slavery and choke it off. And also Europe is becoming so modernized and so industrialized that there is this uh, growing fear that there is going to be a war between these, uh, between these empires. And so they are looking for a way to gentlemanly carve up Africa and avoid transgressions and military actions between each other. Spoiler alert, uh, when it comes to avoiding this kind of industrialized warfare that they were, they've been concerned about since the 1880s, uh, that will come to fruition in 1914 with World War I, which will take place in Europe uh, mostly, but that kind of fear that there will be an industrialized mechanized war uh, eventually will happen. It just won't happen until 1914. So they carve up Africa and they turn it into a series of colonies. So you can see that here. Uh, so in 1880, which is a year before the Berlin Conference, there are uh, sections of Africa that are taken as colonies by this point, some of those islands and port cities. Uh, the United States has a small colony here for uh, black individuals that were recolonized or colonized out of the country called Liberia. Uh, we have uh, the French jumped over fairly early in the 1860s and conquered what is today Algeria that is controlled by the French. Uh, if you go there today, they speak French and Arabic. Uh, they also take parts of what becomes uh, Tunisia. There's an independent Arab kingdom of Morocco, which is in a cooperative relationship with the French, but eventually the French take them over too. The Brit the French own, uh, have Egypt for a while, but then the French come and take Egypt, or oh, yeah, I'm sorry, reverse that. The French have Egypt for a while, then the British come in and take Egypt from them, then the French come in and try to take it back, but then the British kick them back out. And, and there's a lot of this going on. The Dutch take South Africa, but then the British take uh, South Africa from the Dutch. Uh, but there's a lot of Dutch people who are there. They call themselves Afrikaners. Uh, so it, it, there, it, there are colonies at this time. Here's the French Congo. But by 1913, a year before World War uh, I, you can see that all of this, all of the continent, for the most part, there are some exceptions, but most of this continent has been thoroughly carved up uh, by the European empires, by France, Great Britain, Spain, Italy, German, Belgium, Liberia, uh, Liberia is the United States, Ethi uh, and Ethiopia is independent. That's over here. Ethiopia was never subjugated. Liberia is technically considered uh, independent, but it's really kind of a quasi colony of, of the United States. And it still weirdly is today. Look at the flag of Liberia uh, and, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. So uh, it didn't take long for uh, 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 Europe. Uh, it didn't take very long for Europeans using their new technologies and their new motivations to completely or nearly subjugate all of Africa. By, in 1880, the, over here, about 10% of the African continent was in control uh, or was controlled by colonial powers. By 1914, about 90% was controlled by colonial powers. That is a major shift in power dynamics. Control of Africa was mixed depending on the uh, uh, power that was uh, in Africa. So the, the, um, the uh, uh, hang on, what's my next slide? Okay, forget about that. So the, uh, the governments that were here, the colonial governments here were purely there for the for extraction, but they found that the African people, uh, not that not that anyone else around the around the world, like in India, were any more docile or anything like that. But Africans themselves were not particularly um, enthusiastic about their kingdoms and their the lands that they lived in being carved up in this manner, especially in such a bizarre jigsaw puzzle kind of way, uh, with really no regards to 
tribal ancestry, uh, uh, national and ancestry, uh, any, anything that re even re uh, remotely looks like the lands that they lived in before. Essentially, Europeans came in, they took a bunch of pens, and they just carved it up all into these odd, odd these odd long uh, colonies, which they claimed control and dominion over, regardless of the people on the ground. And so there were a lot of uprisings and rebellions and revolutions. So the European powers ended up garrisoning a lot of soldiers in Africa in order to put down these rebellions and try to keep people subjugated under European colonial rule. Also, unlike in other parts of um, other parts, other colonies, such as in, in India, despite the fact that there was a lot of corruption, despite the fact that there was a lot of racism, and that Indians wanted more say in their own government, there were reforms to try and uh, incorporate Indians into their government, for example. Whereas in Africa, because of there was so much unrest and so much uh, rebellion, that generally speaking, only whites that were living in these African colonies, regardless of what white European heritage they had, were given the power to vote. And this further inflamed and enraged Africans uh, who demanded some kind of position in their government. Now, some were more uh, rebellious. They wanted to completely throw out the colon uh, colonial uh, uh, administrators. Some were willing to work within the colonial framework, but were completely obsessed, or uh, I should say incest, by not being allowed to vote and be incorporated as citizens in this colonial holding. And so that would just, again, further create more instability in the region, which required more troops and more violent action. So there was a lot of tension here, but some colonies were clearly worse than the other, uh, worse than others. Uh, we should also mention that when the uh, colonial European powers came into Africa, they did make attempts to spread civilization, uh, and this was for good or for bad. And I'm, I'm, we today as a people, regardless of where we're from, and I, I've looked at the pictures of U.S. students, I see that there are African American students here. Uh, we have some students from Asia here. Oh, we have white students here. We have, it's a very diverse crowd. So we are using our, our modern day moral values to, to judge this, but there were some th reforms that we might call today good. For example, in Africa, in not in all, not of all of Africa, of course, but in some African uh, nations and parts of African society, it was considered appropriate and perfectly fine and legal to mutilate female genitalia, uh, which was outlawed immediately by the likes of the French and the British and the Germans. Uh, they would not allow female uh, mutilation uh, in that sense, they would not allow, ch uh, they forbid child marriage and outlawed child marriage. They outlawed polygamy and the ability for men to kind of not buy and sell, but really lord over um, their daughters uh, in, a, in a very paternalistic sort of way. So a lot of that was outlawed by these British or by these European governments. They also instituted uh, traditional European style education, which also included education for women, for young women. So you have, uh, like in India, uh, you have uh, these uh, educational reforms that enabled women who were typically denied an education, a formal education, to go to school, to learn how to read, write, do arithmetic. And in some cases, uh, especially with the, with the British, but the French do this too, uh, uh, there are Africans, and Gandhi later on in India, Gandhi will be one of these individuals uh, that will go back to Britain or go to Paris in France, and they will study at universities uh, and and further themselves within this European system. There are women who are allowed to do this as well. So there are a number of opportunities for women that were not uh, typically allowed beforehand. On the other hand, uh, women, uh, believe it or not, despite the fact that there are there is a lot of male control, uh, female uh, mutilation of, of of their genitalia. Uh, Women, uh, African nations, uh, had a strong matriarchal heritage. So while there were Afri great African kings and African leaders, there were also African queens. And a lot of property and a lot of traditions were handed down not through the father's line, but through the mother's line. 
when European powers came and conquered these African territories, that was removed and replaced with a more traditional European patriarchal line where property passed between fathers and sons, not uh, mothers and daughters. Women were also allowed to kind of run shops and take part in um, in kind of family business and family industries because that's just the way it, that's just the way it was done and when that happened uh british officials and french officials and german officials would no would no longer meet and discuss business or land holdings or deals with women instead they would defer to the women's husbands so there are some uh unfortunate changes that go along with the ones that sound fairly reasonable to us today now, before the Europeans get in on the game here, what they would refer to as the scramble for Africa between the 1880s and to about 1914, uh, Africa was very, very dynamic. These different nations uh, traded amongst themselves. Uh, they traded palm oil, timber, coffee, uh, skins, food, salt, uh, gold, diamonds. Uh, they traded slaves among themselves and slaves with Arabs who would come down from the Middle East via the Trans-Saharan slave trade. Uh, and those Arab traders introduced um, a traditional currency like coinage, Islam, and written language, which most of these African nations did not have. They were more oral traditionalists. Uh, when, wherever Islam went, they brought their written traditions and their traditions of keeping business records uh, for things like money and accounting. Uh, so Africa was very, very di diverse, very dynamic. They traded a lot with Asia on the East Coast here. Uh, and they traded with India and China, uh, Madagascar too, and they traded up with the uh, Arabs in the Middle East. And over here on the West Coast, there was a lot of trade with Europe uh, in the form of ivory, slaves, gold, uh, and uh, and the like. After the eighteen, uh, after the scramble began throughout the eighteen eighties and into nineteen fourteen. Uh, that begins to change. There are still a lot of exports out of Africa, pretty much the stuff that I mentioned before, palm oil, timber, bananas, coffee, uh, certain types of spices. Uh, but mainly what they do is all these raw materials are harvested right out of Africa. The slave, slavery is gone. By the, time, by, by the time this happens, by the time the 1880s is gone, they have stopped trading slaves in the European world. And Europeans, are, a lot of them are going in Africa to stop, further stop the slave trade. But they are trading uh, mostly these raw materials out of Africa to Europe, and Europe in t uh, imports or sends back to be imported into Africa textiles. Africans were quite famous for their textiles, especially their dyes, but they are importing modern-made European-style textiles in modern factories, uh, which Euro which Africans actually do like to buy because it's a form of a status symbol, although they do, they, they do use a lot of traditional African dyes and colors and mix and match these things together, which Europeans like to do for themselves too. But they are wearing more traditional European clothing by this point. They like to import and buy firearms, uh, which all Always is the case. Uh, I jokingly tell my students, Europe and the United States throughout the world, uh, when they do this kind of stuff, if they can't, if there's something that people don't want, uh, uh, there is always one thing that they do want, and that's firearms. And so they're always arms dealing. Firearms uh, and 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 modern tools like picks, axes, shovels, and cutlery, knives, forks, spoons, uh, things of that nature. Uh, for uh, on the European end of it, what they get out of it, I mentioned all of that before: timber, palm oil, fruits, coffee, but also gold, silver, tusks, animal skins, and perhaps the biggest one of all diamonds. Diamonds that are taken out of the African mines, a lot of them owned by the Dutch, uh, the most famous of which was the De Beer Diamond Mine, which is owned by the Dutch and later taken over by a man named Cecil Rhodes, who is a British um, uh, member of lower nobility, Cecil Rhodes. He creates the Rhodes Scholarship, which is given out to exceptional American students to go to England to study at Oxford and Cambridge. And he owns the De Beer Diamond Mine, which produces the largest diamonds in the world and, and the largest quantities of them. They are the ones who created the British Crown Jewels. Diamonds up until that point were used as uh, industrial tools for cutting things because diamonds are extremely hard and can be sharpened. But then they are turned into jewels for the British monarch. 
uh, Queen Victoria, and all of a sudden they become a fashion symbol for women around the world, an example of wealth that men can buy for the women in their lives. And if you are familiar with those diamond ads on television that say a diamond is forever, De Beers, all of that comes because of the scramble for Africa. By 1914, which is really the end of this great period, and like I said, next week we're going to talk about China and Japan more closely, how they were carved up, how they were subjugated, or in the case of Japan, how they were able to kind of resist a lot of that and become imperialists themselves. And that will take us right into to really up until World War II with, where Japan is concerned. But uh, by 1914... By 1914, on the eve of World War I, what you see here in color are all, is all subjugated to the great powers of the world. Japan is kind of doing its own thing. China is still relatively independent. But look at the Russian territory here. Look at the control that the French wield throughout Africa and the British wield throughout Africa. British controlled Canada, Brit, uh, gr the British Isles, uh, British controlled African colonies, British India, um, the parts of the British Middle East. British uh, controlled holdings in Australia, New Zealand, uh, all of this being Russia. China is quite large. French Indochina, the United States has Alaska by this point. They have Hawaii. Uh, they exert considerable influence over the Caribbean and over South America in an indirect sort of way. Uh, the Danes, uh, the Danes, yeah, Denmark, the Danes control, uh, no, I'm sorry, not, not the Danes. No, wait, the Danes. Yes, the Danes, hang on a second. Yeah, the Danes. Uh, the Danes control uh, Iceland and Greenland, uh, which was in the news recently because uh, apparently Donald Trump wanted to buy it. I, I can't really figure out if that, was, if that was true or not or if he was just toying with it, but that popped up in the news not too long ago. Uh, all of this, all of what you see in color here corresponds to these flags. We're under the control of powers that were colonial and imperialist in nature. And so none of the people that actually live on the ground in these territories that would be referred to as the indigenous people actually controlled their own, their own land. They were not uh, masters of their own domain. Instead, they were subjugated to colonial rule. There is one correction I want to make. I just realized that this map is not from 1914. It must be from about 1890 because I do see that uh, Cuba... Puerto Rico, some of these islands over here, and the Philippines, Guam, and that are under Spanish control. By 1914, all you would have to do is simply replace this with the same blue color as the United States here and over here, and you pretty much have the, the map the way it should be. So this brings us to the end of our lecture on Western dominance and imperialism. Uh, we've covered a lot of material next week. The lecture will not be nearly as long because we will be simply going back in time and kind of going over the same period, but we will looking, we'll be looking more closely at China and Japan, uh, and that will take us through to the beginning of World War I. But I wanted to show you that over the course of 1880 to 1914, which is the eve of World War I, look at how much of the globe is now under control of European, Western European powers plus Russia, Western European powers plus Russia and China, or I'm sorry, J uh, Japan, uh, and how much imperialism and colonialism is taking place. It really is the golden age or the heyday of European uh, colonialism and imperialism all of which was made possible by uh, these kind of ideas of social Darwinism and expansionism, laissez-faire, capitalist economics, and industrialism, and the advancements that industrial technology brought, be it through firearms or uh, medicinal and uh, hygienic improvements that allowed people to take over lands that they previously could not have taken over. I hope that you found this lecture, although very long, extremely stimulating. I hope it was able to link these previous units together and that it did make sense. I do promise that next week's lecture will not be nearly as long because we're going to just be simply taking a small microcosm here and going through, still with a lot of detail, how China and Japan go through imperialism and how they come out 
very differently. One becomes an imperialist power, the other one becomes the, the, um, the base of imperialist operations. With that, I hope all of you have a very good week and that uh, you perform uh, your assignments well and do very well. And uh, if you need me at all, please again, uh, send me a message. And uh, if you need to talk more directly, we can set up a Google chat. With that, good luck and have a good rest of the week.